Sup, you beautiful bastards. Welcome back to the Philip DeFranco Show on a week where we're uploading a new video every single day. So buckle up, hit that like button, and let's just jump into it. Let's knock out some quickie news to keep you up to date. Uh, you have Andrew Tate taking more public L's with a Romanian judge now denying Tate's fourth appeal to try and end his detention. That, of course, related to his December 29th arrest with authorities acting on their suspicion that he and three others were engaging in human trafficking and organized crime. And of course, since then, his detention has been extended three times with the main arguments from the judge being that Tate poses a particular dangerousness. An that a free Tate could potentially start publicly identifying the six women listed as victims. So now he's behind bars until at least March 29th. And a very key thing here is that the authorities actually have the ability to keep this tactic up for several more months because they're allowed to detain suspects and in investigations for up to 180 days, which could mean by the end of June. Also, a side question, who did he give control of his Twitter account? Like some of this stuff coming from that account is just strange. Like what is this tweet? I was awoken last night by an icy chill and identified a ghost in my prison cell. He was terrified and begged me not to annihilate him. I sent him back to hell with a message for the demons. I am always ready. Also, in addition to everything else, the biggest hypocrite in the world. Motherfucker tweeted, when you lie, you make a very powerful enemy. God. Andrew, and or the insane person who's tweeting about fighting ghosts. There's video of you on the internet where you knowingly sat down in front of cameras to speak on one of the biggest podcasts in the world where not only did you admit, you gloated about lying to and scamming guys out of their life savings while posing as cam girls. So the chicks would sit there and hit a keyboard that wasn't plugged in. And me and my brother, and eventually some staff I trained, would do all the talking. The girls were just pure, just famosers, just laughing and doing this, their titties out. And they were talking to f***ing ice cold hustlers. Talking about how you trick poor saps into thinking that this cam girl loves them, but it's just like a bunch of people running their account. I had these guys selling their houses, life savings, loans, all of it. And you trick these poor guys posing as a woman saying you need money for this and that. So eventually they can kind of, you know, see each other and be together. She was famousing when she was asleep. We were bringing in money for the f***ing sky. We were promising all these meetings, all these pictures outside of embassies, all this and then when you scam them out of their money and they get mad, you make them seem like they're the aggressive guy. Oh Flip it on God. him, and he'd get f***ing furious because we were really good you're at f***ing sides. P yeah, poking him to the point where he'd go like, you're a f***ing scammer, you f***ing scam me, get really mad. I can't believe you think I was a scammer. I was going to come. I went to the embassy. You're a f***ing liar. Every man in my life has only lied to me. I thought you were different. Maybe I just got too mad yeah, when she had a headache. Maybe... Maybe I, maybe I should have been a little bit more patient and she would have been my girlfriend. And a hundred percent of the time in less than three months with an apology, a brand new pile of money and the cycle would repeat. We f***ing killed the game. Millions of dollars a week. Your life and lifestyle is built on a mountain of lies. You can hide behind your adopted faith all you want now, but you better hope there's not actually a god. I just don't think it's gonna go well for you. Then in huge online entertainment news, we gotta talk about Kai Sinet. Because not only has he blown up over the past year to become pretty much the biggest streamer in the world, he is absolutely smashing subscriber records over on Twitch right now. He's nearing the end of a 30-day subathon with his stream now having been live 24-7 since it started on February 1st. Last week becoming the third Twitch streamer to ever reach 200,000 concurrent subscribers, also reportedly the first black streamer to ever do so, with him now today beating out Ninja's previous peak of 269,000 concurrents, and as of recording, reaching 274,000 subscribers, making him the second most subscribed creator in the platform's history, only behind Ludwig, who managed to hit 283,000 subs in 2021. But I have a feeling Kai's gonna break this record any minute now. And then, let's talk about the Take It Down project and what it really says about the, the moment. Or because this is a project that's billed as letting young people take back control of their intimate images by letting them proactively choose to have intimate images and videos of themselves blocked from online platforms. Right, so this would include full or partial nudity and even poses that are just too sexual. And while that's how it's being described, it's also not just a, a platform for young people. Or reportedly a parent or a, a trusted adult could do this process for someone in addition to adults who are worried about images from when they were under 18. And when you hear that, you might think what I also thought. Does that mean you're uploading your images to take it down servers like on a database where it's gonna get maintained? Doesn't that just open up the door for hackers to try and grab that data? Well, they say they already thought of that. So they say instead, the system works by letting someone choose the images they want to be blocked and then take it down, assigns a unique hash code, kind of think of it as a, a fingerprint for that exact image. So when a copy of that image is uploaded to participating platforms, it's checked for unique markers assigned to that hash and blocked if it matches. Right, so they're saying that the actual image never leaves the user's device and no one but the person who uploaded ever has access to what the image looks like. They're saying that the data is essentially completely open, it's just a bunch of numbers. And also, if the uploader wants, they don't even have to give any identifying information about themselves. Now currently, the system is only available from takeitdown.ncme.gov. 
ac.org. But pretty soon, Facebook and Instagram are going to have integration within their apps to make the process easier for people, with even Pornhub and OnlyFans being major partners in this project, meaning that they'll actively block and remove content that matches any hashes that people have uploaded into the database, with it expected that more platforms are going to join the project as well. And then, Crossley Green is going back to prison. Which, if you don't know, he was the man who was in prison for decades due to a 1989 murder, but he was released in 2018 after it was revealed that there were major issues with his case. Namely, that evidence that could have possibly helped him was withheld from his team. We're talking about things like notes from first responders saying that they thought he was innocent and that officers on the scene thought someone else was responsible. However, that decision was sent to the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals and Green was placed under house arrest in April of 2021, pending their decision, which came last year when they ruled that while the evidence should have been handed over to the defense, it was ultimately immaterial to the case. Although Green's defense attorney at the time disagreed, saying that if he had known that this evidence existed, he would have handled Green's defense differently. But either way, what this meant was that this was headed to the U.S. Supreme Court and Green was allowed to be free until they made their decision, which we now know is that they've decided not to hear the case at all, meaning he's heading back to prison with his attorney telling reporters, Mr. Green and his family were devastated by the news today, yet they are a family of remarkable faith and they are clinging to one remaining hope, that the state of Florida will grant clemency or parole. There is still time for the state to do the right thing. But there, uh, granting parole, probably not going to happen. He's reportedly been eligible for a while as a model prisoner who's never committed an offense behind bars, but has refused to do so as it requires admitting guilt. And since he's vowed to never do that, it means that his only real option is to pray that Governor Ron DeSantis grants him clemency, which I mean, that's a completely up in the air thing. Right, Green's case isn't some like random unknown thing. It was actually a very big deal for a while. Uh, the prosecution has increasingly left doubt in people's minds. Right, his fingerprints were never found at the scene. Witnesses recanted their testimony, also saying the police coerced them. And that's just some of the issues. But at the same time, DeSantis has been on the record like many Republican politicians of wanting to be tough on crime. Although notably there, he does have a record of granting at least some clemencies and pardons during his time in office. But for now, we'll have to wait and see. And then in other news, I'm excited to announce the relaunch and rebrand of the DeFranco Daily Download email newsletter. Some of you may remember when I kicked off a newsletter back in 2021, and I'm finally ready to relaunch with great content, new branding, additional ways to interact with the show, a dedicated team, and a vision and roadmap that's going to be shaped by you beautiful bastards. Introducing the Daily Dip. And the Daily Dip's goal is exactly what it sounds like. Sign up to get a quick taste of the news that you may have missed on the PDS, along with tons of bonus content that'll keep you informed, put a smile on your face, and let you get back to your day in three to five minutes or less. Dip in, dip out. One of my favorite parts about the relaunch is that it creates a new way for me to hear directly from you through our Daily Dipper poll, where you can share your opinions on the news, but also see what others are thinking when they dip in. So as far as what to do, we are launching phase one of the newsletter in mid-March, so be sure to join the waitlist ASAP, especially because all you early bird subscribers will be eligible for chances to win exclusive prizes just for being the first Daily Dipper. So whether this is the first time you're thinking about signing up or you even signed up back in 2021, that is a different list. So go to dailydip.co or click the link in the description now to join the waitlist for free. And then more than 650 schoolgirls have been poisoned in Iran. That's the latest figure since November when 18 students from a technical school were hospitalized. Reportedly, they smelled something like tangerine or rotten fish, and then they fell ill with symptoms like respiratory problems, nausea, dizziness, and fatigue. And while fortunately, nobody appears to have died thus far, the poisonings just keep coming with more than 10 girls' schools getting targeted in the surrounding province since the first incident, as well as at least 194 girls in the past week alone. And as for who's behind this, we currently don't know. I mean, some suspect the government, others allege that it's an extremist group. But on Sunday, the country's deputy health minister apparently confirmed that the poisonings were intentional, saying it became evident that some people wanted all schools, especially girls' schools, to be closed down. Though we later saw him backpedaling on that, saying that he was misunderstood. But this, as a member of the parliament's health commission, also confirmed they were intentional. And now the government says that they're investigating the incidents. And in the meantime, several schools have shuttered. And for those that haven't, girls are just refusing to return. With one teacher, for example, saying out of 250 students, only 50 attended classes. And the response to this has been utter frustration. With parents protesting outside of the governor's office in the city, where most of these cases are being reported, with one father shouting, I have two daughters, two daughters, and all I can do is not let them go to school. And another woman adding, this is war. They want girls to stay at home. And a key thing with all this is this is coming as protests over the killing of Masa Amini last September still rock the country, with one human rights group counting over 20,000 arrests and at least 500 deaths. But the protests there have become more rare in recent weeks. And that's in no small part because of repression or the crackdown from the government, but also because people are more worried right now about their livelihoods rather than political activism, or because the economy there continues to crumble with inflation at 53% last month, up from 41% two years ago. And the local currency is rapidly losing value, plummeting to a record low on Sunday, leading people to line up outside of exchange offices to grab as many dollars as they can before their life savings evaporate. With a lot of these problems, unfortunately, made even worse by the crippling sanctions gripping the country, which have yet to ease since talks to revive the nuclear deal have stalled for months. With Iran having now enriched enough uranium for several atomic weapons should it choose to develop them according to the UN's nuclear watchdog. And then, this is one of the worst accidental tragedies 
tragedies Europe has seen in a while now. It's believed that four days ago, a boat carrying up to 200 people departed from Turkey, seeking to unload near a seaside Italian resort. But this boat, while traveling through stormy seas in the black of night, crashed into some rocks and broke apart while trying to land. So it sank with many passengers swimming safely to shore, but also dozens more washing up dead alongside debris. The disaster killing a confirmed 63 people so far, though some fear that number could rise to 100, with among the dead at least 12 children. And as of recording, the Coast Guard has rescued 80 survivors, also arresting three they believe to be human traffickers. The bodies of those who died being blessed by a priest before being removed. The survivors also given blankets on the beach before being sheltered. But the trauma wrought from this is immeasurable. You've got families crying out for one another, parents screaming for their children, a man whose wife and three children died holding on to his only surviving son. And with all this, one rescue worker saying, it reminds us all that the Mediterranean is a giant mass grave with tens of thousands of souls in it, and it continues to widen. Because while over 105,000 migrants have successfully crossed the sea into Italy last year, some 1,300 are dead or missing. And as believed in 2023, 12,000 have already made the journey, with them usually fleeing from poverty, violence, and instability in third world countries to the east. In this case, Case coming from Afghanistan, Pakistan, Somalia, Syria, Iraq, and Iran, according to media reports. And as far as the response we've seen, you had recently elected Prime Minister Giorgia Meloni, the far-right leader of what some call Italy's neo-fascist parties, saying the only solution is to stop migrant boat departures and blaming the human traffickers who organized them. But also, connected to this, her government passed a decree last week that requires charity ships to return to port immediately after a rescue. So unlike before, where they would spend several days at a time out in the open water completing rescues before coming back. And any captain that disobeys because they're trying to save lives, they risk fines of up to $53,000 as well as their vessel getting impounded. And in fact, we're already seeing that happening. A few days ago, authorities detained and fined a ship from Doctors Without Borders. And then, if you've watched my show for a while, you know that uh, in my 20s, I had an irrational fear of black holes. But as it turns out, the, the thing that I should have been scared of is the thing that's closer to this floating rock, and that is the sun. Right? And that's because every 11 years or so, the sun goes through a solar cycle, solar minimum to solar maximum. And we're in the solar cycle 25, with the peak of the solar maximum expected sometime next year or in 2025. But in the meantime, that means that this year may be one of the most powerful years for the sun in a decade. And this is happening because the magnetic poles on the star abruptly flip, which messes with the sun's polarity. And that instability causing more activity on the surface of the sun, which causes issues for us. We're talking about things like it could ground planes, kill astronauts, and cause power outages. Right, as far as grounding planes, we're looking at a situation where the sun's magnetic fields are getting all messed up. They could crash into each other and explode. And when that happens, energy and charged particles are thrown into space, messing with the ionosphere here on Earth. And fun fact or potential jeopardy question, both satellite and radio communications rely on the ionosphere which are kind of key things when it comes to flights. And so the FAA would ground flights. Also, as far as power outages, as the sun's explosions mess with the ionosphere, it can create currents which interact with particles on the ground. And that could theoretically flood infrastructure here on Earth to the point that it blows up transformers. Not those. Those. Though notably, it would have to be an absolutely massive geomagnetic storm hitting Earth to put multiple transformers out of commission. And then as far as the killing astronauts, uh, I think that's just that, you know, I feel like that's the, the most straightforward one. Right? I mean, I'm gonna give you the specifics, but I think you can fill in the blanks. You're like, yeah, sun explosions, probably bad to be out there. Right? But the sun, it lets off radioactive material that people here on Earth are mostly protected from thanks to the atmosphere. But hey, uh, not all doom and gloom. As the sun becomes more active, like we talked about, it interacts with the ionosphere, and that's what causes auroras like the northern lights. And so when the geomagnetic storms hit Earth's ionosphere, the auroras become brighter and larger. So the auroras actually end up being visible further south than expected. Some even reportedly visible in the southern UK over the weekend. And ultimately, for me, this situation feels like, it feels like the sun is my wife. Fun for me to look at, but also potentially deadly in certain situations. And that's where today's show ends. Thanks as always for being a part of my daily dives into the news. Remember this week, come back every day. I got a brand new video every single day, seven videos this week. And if you miss one, I'll get you covered right here as always. But my name's Philip DeFranco. You've just been filled in. I love yo faces and I'll see you tomorrow.